Lecture 27, Julius Caesar in History. In this course, we discuss heroes, myth, and history. And we have focused primarily on heroes like Jason or Achilles, who have a kernel of truth to them, but myth has transformed them into figures that are larger than life. But there are individuals who do not need myth to transform them, whose very individual achievements in the full light of history are themselves world transforming. These are the world historical figures, those heroes who lead the world to an entire new level of achievement. I believe, along with the historian of the 19th century, the British historian Thomas Carlyle, that great men and women make history. That history is not the product of anonymous social and economic forces. That great individuals, great events, great ideas, that is what shapes history. And in this lecture, we want to deal with such a world-transforming figure, world historical figure, Julius Caesar. Indeed, I believe that among mortals, there have been only two world historical figures. One, as we have seen, is Alexander the Great, and the second is Julius Caesar. To understand Caesar, the hero, I want you to go back with me to March 15th, 44 BC, the Ides of March. Julius Caesar is on his way to the Senate. He is expecting that day to be offered the royal diadem, to be, be, to be made king of the Roman Empire. You'll remember that Brutus, Ah, Lucius Junius Brutus, the founder of the Roman Republic in 509 BC, had made the Romans swear that they would never again have a king. But such are the achievements of Caesar, and such is the need of Rome, that only a king can bring back the grandeur of the Roman Empire, and indeed create an empire that will bring peace and prosperity to the world for two centuries to come. That is the goal of Caesar. He has come a long way. Born in 100 BC, he takes us back to another of our lectures, Aeneas. It was believed that the son of Aeneas, Julius, was the founder of the line from which Julius Caesar himself came, the Julii, one of the most patrician and ancient families in Rome. So Julius Caesar lineage went back to Julius, to Aeneas, and back to the goddess Venus herself. And Venus was his particular chosen patron divinity, and he had recently completed a forum in her honor, outside of the traditional Roman forum. Born in 100, he was seen as nothing more than a two-bit politician by 60 BC. In other words, by the time he had reached the age of 40. The Rome in which he grew up was far removed from those heroic days of old sung about for Horatius at the bridge, or those heroic days that saw the Romans overcome Hannibal and Carthage. The Roman Republic of 60 BC very much resembled another country in the 21st century. Its noble constitution, the balanced constitution that was so admired by the founders of our country had been utterly corrupted. And the corruption, as the Romans themselves knew, came from money, wealth. Under that constitution, that mixed constitution, that balanced constitution, Rome had gained an empire. It was, in 60 BC, the superpower of its day. Just as the founders of our country knew and feared. 
that our balanced constitution would bring us an empire. That we would become a superpower. But with the superpower status also comes wealth and affluence. And the founders of our country, like the Romans, believe that a people can withstand everything except too much affluence. And thus, the Constitution of Rome had been undermined. Bitter partisan politics brought the Roman state to an absolute gridlock. Budgets could not even be passed because the two political parties so fought against one another. Their names even sound eerily familiar. There were the populares, the Democrats, they stood for an aggressive foreign policy and, above all, for entitlements to the Roman people. The Roman people had grown accustomed to having free food handed out to them on a regular basis and free entertainment provided by gladiatorial games. And the only way you got elected in the Roman system, the only way you would ultimately reach the Senate, or the position of being consul of the Roman Republic, was by spending lots of money on campaigns. You spent a great deal of money and you had to raise that money. And the economy of Rome was part of a global economy. Roman coins and merchandise circulated all the way to China. Chinese silks brought across the Silk Road uh, could be bought in the markets of Rome. And there were vast companies, uh, stock companies. You would buy stock in a company, it would go on a merchant venture, and you could realize as much as 12 times your investment if you were a gambler. The um, wealth also encouraged debt. And many a wealthy Roman and many an ordinary Roman citizen went heavily into debt. That merchant venture was such a sure thing that you borrowed in order to be part of that deal. And when it collapsed, there you were. Or you borrowed very heavily from these same stock companies in order to pay your campaign fees. And if you were elected to a consulship, or even the lower on the rung, the praetorship, afterwards you were sent out to one of the provinces to govern. And there, that's when you made up all the money you had to borrow when you had run for office. The taxation system was totally corrupt. The Roman people paid no taxes. They did not want that share of their country's uh, economy. They were, they were completely immune to taxation. But the provincials, the non-Roman citizens, had to pay enormous rates of taxation. And the way the taxes were done is that they were collected by a system of tax farming. That is to say, in Rome, each year, an auction was held, a closed auction, and these stock companies made bids. And if you bid $4 billion in our currency and won, you went out and collected the taxes, and whatever you got over the $4 billion was your profit. Do you think you were particularly uh, scrupulous about how you collected that money? And if the provincials complained that you had extorted $10 billion from them, you could, the, the provincials could indeed lodge a complaint, which would be tried by a jury of senators. So the provincials had no interest whatever in the Roman Empire. To them, it was an oppressive, brutal system. And the Roman army, it had changed. The army that conquered Hannibal was a citizen militia. But in 106 BC, the Romans had voted, the Roman people, to abandon the system of a draft, that's what it was, conscription, and instead have a professional army on the grounds that um, these wars were too complicated, modern military technology was too complicated for a citizen soldier, and thus there was a professional army made up of Roman citizens, but men who served up to 20 or 25 years, that was their career. And for thoughtful Romans, when the Roman people no longer wanted to serve their country, that was the true mark that they no longer wanted that 
political freedom, which had been the essence of Rome. And foreign policy. 60 BC, Rome was stuck in a series of wars in the Middle East. Only six years before, 66, pirates and an organized ring of terrorists captured and held hostages the wives of Roman senators. And Rome, with all its might, could do nothing about this terrorist network. And there were wars in distant places, like Iraq. And there was the empire of Iran that the Romans had allowed to arise on their eastern frontier. A wealthy empire with superb military technology. And much, in fact, of the Roman debt went out through the land of Iran. Hard currency being exchanged for luxury items, which the Roman people thought they could not live without. So, foreign policy issues, enormous debt, an economy in shambles, and an empire that no longer wanted Rome to govern it. That was the Rome of 60 BC. Two of the leading politicians of the day were Marcus Licinius Crassus and Gnaeus Pompeius. Crassus was by far, by far the most wealthy man in the Roman Empire. And as sometimes has happened in American politics, he thought making a lot of money made him also uh, a good politician and a statesman. Gnaeus Pompeius was a capable general, and in fact, he had done a considerably good job of putting an end to the terrorist uh, network. He simply divided, in the year 66 BC, the Mediterranean into five regions, captured every terrorist he could, and hanged them, or crucified them. And that put an end to terrorism. He had also managed to bring about a foreign policy settlement in the Middle East. And in 60 BC, Crassus and Pompey, both rivals, but knowing they had to work together, decided they needed a politician who would do anything for anybody to get two bills passed through the Senate. Because the Pompey and Crassus were both blocked by Marcus Portius Cato. He would not be at home today in politics. He knew no compromise whatsoever, and he was determined to bring about the old Roman liberty through his party, the Optimates, the exact opposite of the Populares. The Optimates meant the best man. The best men are the party of traditional Roman values. They were for a modest foreign policy, fiscal responsibility, and no entitlements whatsoever. And Cato had enough votes in the Senate to block the plans of Pompey and Crassus. Crassus wanted a bailout for some of his friends who had made a bad bargain, and he wanted the Roman government to step in and bail them out. And um, Pompey wanted his settlement in the Middle East confirmed as a whole on block by the uh, Roman Senate and then by the Roman people. They were not able to achieve this. So they turned to Gaius Julius Caesar, already 40 years of age, well-educated. He had studied in Greece, could give magnificent orations, though nobody knew it yet. He was a poet, and, uh, but completely inexperienced in military affairs. But he had a vision, and that is what makes a hero in place of an ordinary, scheming political leader. Caesar had a vision, and that vision was of a revitalized Roman Empire with himself as absolute ruler, a Roman Empire that would bring peace and prosperity to the provinces, would secure the borders of Rome by the conquest of the fierce Gauls, what we would call France today, and ultimately by the conquest of the Germans and of the Iranians. When he had gone out for his position as praetor a short time, few years before, he was passing through a small village, along with a group of his friends who were going to be with him during this term out in Spain. 
And it was in the south of France, what was Roman Gaul at the time. And they passed through this really dirty little village. And his friend said, ooh, how could anybody live in a place like this? And Caesar turned on them and said, I would be, rather be the number one man in this dump than the number two man in all of the Roman Empire. And there in Spain, while he was praetor in 61 BC, his friends came into the room one night and found him weeping uncontrollably. And he was seated before a bust of Alexander. Before he was 33, Alexander had conquered the world, and I have done nothing. That ambition, that driving ambition, that is what a hero must have. He got the job done. He proved to be a very smooth manipulator of the senatorial system. And when in 58 BC he was offered a position as governor, what in Roman terms was called a proconsul, he took Gaul, the ancient enemy of the Romans. They alone had captured Rome in the year 390 BC. They had taught the Romans the meaning of the proverb. Way wictis, woe to the conquered. If you lose, you can expect no mercy whatsoever. And Gaul, only the southernmost part of it was uh, attached to the Roman Empire, annexed. All beyond was what we would call today the land of France, and for, to the Romans was long haired Gaul, free Gaul. And Caesar's mandate from the Senate was that he could operate as governor in that very southern tip, Roman Gaul, but if it seemed in the interest of the Roman people, he could cross into free Gaul. Well, it seemed in the interest of the Roman people. Caesar is the model of a statesman who has the supreme quality of a statesman, and that is foresight. That is to see a problem before it becomes a problem, and then to solve it with a solution that is good in the short and long term. And Caesar was determined to develop a military reputation, a loyal army, vast wealth, and then seize power however it was necessary over the Roman Republic. Gaul. For an inexperienced general, it looked like a disaster waiting to happen. But in six long and bloody years from 58 to 52 BC, Caesar showed himself to be one of the greatest generals in history. In fact, as Napoleon himself would recognize, every other general in history was just a, po a pale reflection of Caesar. A master of strategy. And from the beginning, his strategy was to conquer all of Gaul and to use the nation of Gaul to revitalize the Roman people and to shift the gaze of the Roman people from the Mediterranean to the northern part of Europe. And he was a master of tactics. This inexperienced general in his very first battle showed his gift of insight into the enemy, these fierce tribes divided among themselves of the Gauls, making use of strategic retreats, making use of artillery in the form of his catapults, but from an offensive position rather than as they'd always been used from a defensive position. And battlefield command. More than once he led his troop, troops into ambush, but when they began to panic, he rallied them fighting sword in hand right beside each of them, and they became utterly devoted to him. In 55 and in 54 BC, having battered most of Gaul into submission, he crossed the English Channel. Caesar remains to this day the only general in history to land his troops, having crossed the English Channel, in Britain, in the face of enemy resistance on the beach. William the Conqueror landed his troops, but the Anglo-Saxons had withdrawn some distance inland to Hastings. Caesar alone carried out this successful amphibious operation 
and carried the Roman standards far beyond the River Thames. And when the Gauls rose up in one more great revolt under their war chief Vercingetorix, Caesar brought him to bay at the town of Alasia, and his army of 40 to 50,000 men overcame a Gallic force of over 300,000. But there were those who would strip Caesar away, strip from Caesar his honor, his dignity. For he was not Alexander the Great, that is to say he was not an absolute monarch. It makes his achievement even greater. He was constantly scrutinized by his enemies in the Roman Senate. They constantly sought for reasons to strip him of his command. They investigated him for war crimes, for having killed 430,000 German women and children and warriors in a sneak attack. But Caesar had now gained his wealth, and with that wealth he could begin to buy heavy influence in the Senate. Thus it was that he found himself on the 14th of February, the year 49 B.C. The next day his command in Gaul would come to an end. His command in Gaul also included the northern part of Italy, and a small little river ran there, the Rubicon. His enemies in the Senate had finally carried the vote. He had to lay down his command as governor, return to Rome as a private citizen, and be investigated. So he pondered. The next day, crossed the Rubicon with his army, his beloved 10th Legion. We're sometimes through, told that he said, the die is cast. That's not what he said. He spoke in Greek and he said, throw the dice high. Throw the die or cast, that means it's all settled, it's faded. Caesar, like every true hero, knows that nothing is faded. So the die are thrown up in the air, and Caesar marches upon Rome, captures the city, defeats his enemy Pompey, and by 46 B.C. is absolute master of the Roman world. He can now begin his task of bringing prosperity back to Rome. He, as a true leader should, understands that the economy is the most important thing to the people. He set about to restore the economy of Rome. He cut taxes, and the provincials ended up paying such a small sum that they only had to work two days a year to pay their taxes. I want you to ponder that as you have filing your taxes one year. They worked two days a year to pay their taxes. In return for that, they received the protection of the best army in the world, a superb set of roads and aqueducts, because Caesar understood that if you leave people with money, they will invest it. He restored the credit of Rome. The credit problem was so great that many people thought they would never get out of debt. And in one fell swoop, what Caesar did was to make every debtor pay back the principal, but not what had grown up in interest. Well, not all the debtors were satisfied, not all the creditors were satisfied, but it worked. By a massive program of public works, rebuilding the infrastructure of Rome, he gave jobs to millions, and he was able to cut the welfare rolls in half. To the provinces, he held out the promise of Roman citizenship, and the grants of citizenship with all the privileges of being a Roman citizen, the kind of privileges that St. Paul enjoyed, such as the right of appeal, the right of freedom of speech, this led the way to ultimately, in 212 A.D., every Roman inhabitant who was free became a citizen of this empire. He founded cities as colonies to give land to his veterans. That was a short-term need. And to Roman citizens who wanted the dignity of work. These grew again into great cities like Carthage and Corinth, Lisbon and Portugal. 
restored the economy, brought prosperity to the Roman people, and in a sign of his remarkable foresight, he solved the question of the calendar. The calendar, you say, what does that have to do with me? Well, he had a short-term problem. The Romans had a lunar calendar, and uh, the lunar calendar gets out of whack with the actual movements of the sun. And the way the Romans had always solved this was to add a certain number of months every so often. Every two or three years, they'd add a month. And that would then make the solar year and the lunar year work together. Very important to the Romans because you had to know the correct day to sacrifice to the gods. So you found yourself sacrificing to Jupiter, the god of wine, in February. So what would you do? Well, today we'd have to set up a committee. Remember our attempts to establish a metric system and all of this? Well, we'd set up a committee and they'd study it and they'd present a huge volume. Not Caesar. He just said, who is the best astronomer in the world? They said, Sosigenes. He works at the Research Institute, the library in Alexandria. Bring him here. All right, Sosigenes, I want you to devise a calendar for me that's a solar calendar, and that will stay accurate. And I want it by the end of business tomorrow. Well, Sosigenes developed a solar calendar, 365 and one quarter days long. So three years would be 365. The fourth, the leap year, would have a day added to February. Now, that is still the same calendar we have. Oh, I know that by 1584, uh, there was a slight discrepancy of um, about 15 days, and Pope Gregory made some tinkering with it, but Gregory himself proclaimed that this is still the calendar of Julius Caesar. So you ponder that. One issue, one man, Caesar, comes up with a solution that you still set your watch by today. And whether you fly out of Tokyo or Cairo or Mumbai, you still date yourself by the calendar of Julius Caesar. But he wanted one thing more. He wanted the title king. In February 15th of 44 BC, he had been made dictator for life. But dictator was a Roman term. The provinces, particularly Asia, could not respond to it. They knew the title king. That's what Alexander had been. Caesar wanted that title. And so a conspiracy grew up against him. The hero. We saw how in the myth of Alexander, he was slain by treachery by his closest friends. And so it was the closest friends of Caesar including some to whom their very lives had been given by Caesar. One of these was Marcus Junius Brutus. He lived upon the myths of his ancient ancestor who had driven the kings from Rome. He brooded upon it. And along with another man who owed his life to Caesar, Gaius Cassius Longinus, they began a conspiracy, 63 men, working together in the dark. They didn't ask brave old Cicero to be part of it because they knew that honest man would go to Caesar and tell him he needed to reform his actions, not try to be king, but Cicero would not scheme against him. Thus it was. Caesar was surrounded by traitors. All of Rome was filled with the stories of this conspiracy. And to show his utter contempt his complete lack of fear of death, Caesar dismissed his bodyguard. I have already lived, he said, long enough, whether in terms of the natural span of my life or the glory I have achieved. His wife tried to warn him from going to the Senate house that day, but like a true hero, he knew that death would come when it would come. The master, Shakespeare, knew he had to borrow nothing from mythology. The pure account of Plutarch, who saw Caesar as the height of all that was heroic in Roman, that was what Shakespeare needed. 
So death will come when it will come. And Caesar on that Ides of March walked into the Senate House and there achieved a heroic death and a memory that would never fade.